All right, Philippians chapter 2, please. All right, we're learning from our Lord and Savior concerning about humility. And another thing is obedience. That's what you're going to find out. It's, it's going to be humility and obedience. And that's the pattern that we're trying to follow. Okay, we're going to look at Philippians chapter 2. We left off at verse 9. Now, let me freshly review about Jesus Christ concerning His obedience. If you might recall, the Bible mentioned about uh, looking unto Jesus. Why? Because He is the author and the finisher of our faith. That was found at Hebrews chapter 12. Amen. And then in Philippians chapter 2, if we were to combine them all together, we learned that the Lord Jesus Christ, when He's obedient, it's all the way till death. It's all the way to death. And it's not just death, though. Another thing that you've already learned is he's also obedient to the death of the cross. That word said even, right? Yeah. So it's even to the death of the cross. So it's important to understand that Jesus Christ, he just did not obey God till death, but the death of the cross is an especially uh, gruesome death. But Jesus Christ bore it and paid it all on our behalf. What a great God. What a great Savior. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have to follow His example of humility and obedience, not just in life, but also in death. But more so than death, it's to the death of the cross, which we shamefully do not follow as much as we should. We should follow His obedience so much to the pattern that it's not just that we're obeying well in this life in loving each other remember that was the context but also the situation should be is it should be even till death I mean if people humiliated you made you feel bad and then you can't uh, stomach that in this life for the Savior what more so when they kill you what more so when they persecute you you can't honestly say that you're going to uh, die for the Lord Jesus Christ and be persecuted for His name's sake if you're not willing to lay down your life that much. The Lord Jesus Christ laid down His life for people so much that He even let them kill Him. That's something pretty big there. Okay, now that we understand the context, let's understand a little bit more. Because the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished that, what did the Bible say? He was rewarded for that. Wherefore, right, so giving a reason that because he obeyed, wherefore, uh, the reason before, uh, excuse me, uh, my mind's not fresh tonight, sorry. So, in explanation, because he was obedient to death, the result is God also hath highly exalted him. So God did something else with Jesus. It says also. So what the Lord did was that he just not just he did not just bless Jesus for his obedience and humility. He did something else in addition. He highly exalted him. He raised him up so high. Yeah. Now, remember, if you go to 1 Peter 5, keep your hand here. We're going to go back to uh, Philippians 2. Go to 1 Peter 5. Remember, if you humble yourself like Jesus, Philippians 2, you recall that? Then what's going to happen? The Bible says he will exalt you. Amen. So that's what Jesus Christ received. But Philippians chapter 2, you'll notice the wording there. It says that, God also hath highly exalted him. So meaning that the Lord, he's giving him something greater than just exalting him. So God's just exalting him so much to the point that it's greater than just a normal exaltation that we received. Jesus Christ, he received something that's even greater than that. So 1 Peter 5 is the normal exaltation if you follow humility that Jesus does. You'll notice at verse 5, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble you, yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. So there's a right timing that the Lord's going to uh, exalt you. 
So how many of you are going through a humbling situation? Well, just remain obedient then. You get humbled in your finances. You get humbled when you're trying to practice love for the brethren and then you feel like that you got a raw deal. So just remember you didn't get as much of a raw deal as Jesus did on the cross with how the people mistreated him. Like I told you before, if that's the case with Jesus Christ, then you have to follow his pattern. And then the Bible says that if you follow this example, then he will exalt you. Now, Jesus Christ, however, he humbled himself more than any other person, including you. Amen. That's right. So if he humbled himself more than any other person, including you, then he gets an exaltation that's higher than any one of you. That's why the Bible shows that it says... God also hath highly exalted him. Why is that? Because it's not just that he exalted him, he additionally exalted him that's higher than any other name. Look at Philippians 2 again. His exaltation is even higher. Philippians chapter 2, and then uh, we'll look at verse 9. Wherefore God also, so that's the important wording, it shows the difference hath highly exalted him, and this is not a normal exaltation like all of us, it's something God added in addition to this exaltation. It's, and given him a name which is above every name. So God gave him a name that's above every name. So any other name that God would exalt, if we humble ourselves, he's going to make sure Jesus Christ's name is above that. That's the idea that we've got to realize. Amen. That's why... The one wording also is important to see that, God's intention behind that. If we keep reading, what's the name that is above every name? That the name of Jesus, yeah, I can get an amen on that one. <laughs> At the name of Jesus, that's the name that's above every name. So no other name, no other name except the name of Jesus that's amen. above every name. And it's a name that you actually have to worship. That's his exaltation. He is God. Name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. So every single knee in this entire universe is supposed to bow the knee at the name of Jesus. So let's look at Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. So, as you might hear in street preaching that people accuse you of hate speech, it's not the name of Muhammad, it's not the name of Buddha, it's not the name of Confucius, it's not the name of Allah, and it's not the name of Charles Russell, it's not the name of Ellen G. White, and it's not the name of Mary Baker Eddy, and it's not the name of Charles Russell, and it's not the name of even John the Baptist, Pope Francis, the Virgin Mary. It is the name of Jesus that saves, and there is no other name that is above that name. Alright? So that's the reason why why the Lord would word it that way. Now, look at, the, look at what God says at Acts chapter 4. We're going to look at Acts chapter 4. And then the disciples realize this at verse 12. Verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That's the name of Jesus at verse 10. Amen. Verse 10. See, no other name. So when people accuse you of a hate speech, no, it's not hate speech. It's Scripture. Amen. It's Scripture. So next time uh, somebody pulls you over for that one or tries to fine you or lock you up in prison for that one, just simply saying, then you're just going to have to lock up Jesus. And don't pretend, you ignorant liberal you, that you love Jesus when you don't. You should find and imprison Jesus. You should find and imprison God for doing that. Oh, we respect God. I, I love God. And, you know, Obama says, I personally receive Jesus Christ as my Savior. And I'm just saved and blah, 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 blah. Whatever, dude. I mean, if you really respect and honor God, then why do you accuse us for hate speech that, hey, you know, it's not Islam, it's not Muhammad. I mean, if you trust those names, they will send you to hell. Those names don't save you. Why do you accuse, how dare you accuse us of hate speech for that one and pretend that you're on God's side? Alright, go to Philippians chapter 2 again. Philippians chapter 2. So every knee has to bow that to that name. 
And it doesn't matter what religion you are. I don't care if you say, oh, I, I can't be a Christian. I'm a Catholic and I will die a Catholic. No, you have to kneel. You have to kneel to Jesus Christ and not the Virgin Mary. Virgin, Mary, If you try to say, if you look at the Virgin Mary while you're bowing, should I kneel? Virgin Mary's going to go, you fool, bow the knee like I'm doing. That's what she's going to be doing. I mean, these people... Uh, What's your name, says the Muslim? My name is Jesus. It's not Allah? I mean, am I bowing to the right being? And then, uh, guess what? Muhammad, you'll see him flat on his face on the ground, and there's your prophet right there. All right, are, are you going to follow now? Are, are you going to bow the knee? How about that, man? Joseph Smith ain't going to be sitting at the right hand of the Father with Jesus at the judgment. He's going to be flat face on the ground at the judgment. God's going to be at the judgment seat. You're all going to bow the knee. And I don't care if you hate me and you unsubscribe and you think that I'm a hateful preacher, you know, or, you know, biased, narrow-minded, my religion's right, everybody else's religion is wrong. What's going to happen is it don't matter, man. We don't have time for a proper etiquette discussion or something like that. No, you have to bow the knee when that happens. Right. But, but I'm a liberal and Jesus says, bow. But I'm, a, uh, but I'm a conservative and I've done good things for God. Bow. But, but my religion is different and that don't fit with my culture. Bow the knee. You, you're going to bow. That's right. Don't matter who you are. All right, going back to Philippians 2, we see that the interesting wording here is that everyone in creation has to bow to Him. But notice the wording here, what follows in creation. It's everything that is in heaven, and then in the earth, and then under the earth, so below. So then it's not just uh, above, it's going to be below. So what, when does this take place? Well, first of all, what I'm going to cover, we're going to cover two verses here in Philippians. So let's do two verses so we can f understand the full context here. So we're going to look at the next verse, and that every tongue should confess. So everyone, or every being that has a tongue, so to speak, uh, it could be a metaphorical phrase or it could be literal itself, but the point is that this phrase is pointing out that every living entity has to confess, so they have to admit publicly that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In order to give glory to God the Father, they have to confess, Jesus Christ, you are Lord. Amen. So that shows here that Jesus Christ, that He's somewhere really high in divinity. So this is not something you water down the deity of Jesus Christ. Otherwise, it's just plain blasphemy. We can see here this is adoration and worship. So Jesus Christ, he is, uh, every tongue has to say publicly that Jesus Christ is Lord and that glorifies God the Father and that's every living entity there. Now, uh, there are several timelines where I can see this happening. The most apparent is the judgment seat of Christ. There's no doubt. Go to Romans 14. Now, you notice I never said great white throne judgment. I said judgment seat of Christ. That wording there is more closer to the judgment seat of Christ than the great white throne judgment, which is pretty interesting. The great white throne judgment is pretty hard to find a wording that's uh, close to there. It's going to be more so with the judgment seat of Christ. So at the judgment seat of Christ, that's where people are going to have to bow the knee and they have to confess out loud, Jesus Christ, you are Lord. And when they confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, they also have to confess, say out loud, not that Jesus is Lord, but every secret thing that they've done in their lives. How about that? So that's the So when the Bible says that every tongue confess, that's important. When every tongue confesses, to God, this confession is, I mean, why do you think they, the Roman Catholics get the idea about confession from? Mm. See, that's every private secret thing that you go through that you tell to a person. So the Roman Catholics, they want to pretend they're Jesus and they're God and you confess to me. Mm. See, that's wicked. That's blasphemous. We don't believe in that. So that's all the secrets and the deeds that you've done in your life that you have to give account of. That's what you're going to find out. All right. 
Look at Romans 14. So when you confess Jesus Christ is Lord, some of you are going to be thinking, that's right, that Muslim is going to confess Jesus Christ is Lord. And you'd be surprised that the God's saying, well, more so in the Scriptures it's speaking to you. Alright, Romans 14, verse 12. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. How about that? You're going to have to give an account to God and that's to the judgment seat of Christ to brothers, Christian brothers. Verse 10, verse 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? See that? Or why dost thou set at not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. See that? So, this is the judgment seat of Christ where you have to give an account. But look at the wording at verse 11. That's Philippians 2. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. See, Philippians chapter 2, we have a thinking that, yeah, that's right, I can't wait that all the false religions will do that. Well, you know, you, I'm more worried about m myself Good, more than the other person. I mean, trust me, the Muslim and the Catholic, they've got uh, t eternity to burn. I think that we don't have to be more concerned about them, them than ourselves. Their time has come and they've got enough. Myself? I'd be worried about myself if I were you. About how I can appear in front of God. Now, returning back, so we can see this has to do, no doubt, with judgment. Okay, so at the judgment seat of Christ, there is no doubt that God has to do that. Would it be reasonable that God could probably do that with the great white throne judgment? In other words, with the lost people? Well, certainly yes. There's no doubt that we can include the lost people here too now. You might say, why is that? Because of the wording of Philippians 2. That's plain as day. If you, uh, reading Philippians 2 again, you'll notice that this is referring to everybody in creation. So it's not just say people. You'll notice that, right? So, because this is everybody in creation, then we know that, ah, so I'm going to have to realize that everybody else who's lost is going to have to do the same thing that I am. So that sounds reasonable. Why? Because Christians have their judgment. They have their secrets that they have to confess to the Lord. Certainly more so with the lost people, with their secrets that they've committed way more than us safe Christians. And that they have to definitely give an account to God. And they are definitely going to go to the judgment. That's more certain. They have to be judged by God for their sinful condition. I mean, if the, Christ the Christians get it, then why not the lost world? You recall 1 Peter where it talks about judgment must begin with the house of God. And then why? Because the whole world goes through the judgment too. Amen. So it's Amen. inclusive of everybody. That's the point. Philippians 2, the wording is no doubt inclusive of everybody. Look at Revelation 20. Revelation 20. Hence the, the great white throne of judgment is where we apply Philippians 2. Because think about it. What time period can we apply Philippians 2 about confessing Jesus Christ as Lord. People have an automatic assumption that it's, well, at the end, at the great white throne judgment. But how do you know you need scripture for that? How we do that is looking through scripture with scripture, Romans 14. Christians do that, their judgment. So then Philippians 2, though, the wording of Philippians 2 shows it's not just Christians, it's everybody. So then if we look at Romans 14, if Christians have to say it at the judgment, with their secrets, illogically follows the lost people will do it at their judgment as they give their secrets. Why? Because Revelation 20 shows that they give account of themselves and they have a judgment. Alright, Revelation chapter 20 and then we'll read verse 11. This is where the Muslim, the Catholic, the Jehovah Witness and the Mormon, they have to confess Jesus Christ is Lord. Verse 11, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books. Look at this, according to their works. So notice here that the lost people have to be judged and give an account of what they did as well. Then we go to Philippians 2 again. If we look at Philippians 2 again, remember the wording here. Who's the one that gives the confession. The one who gives the confession is things above. 
So that's a given. We Christians will go up in heaven. Amen? So we're going to have to confess to the Lord. But it says things on the earth, right? So if we say that if it's talking about things on the earth, well, obviously all of us are human beings. So maybe concerning earthlings here, right? The wording, things on the earth. So earthlings here give the confession to God. And then the heavenly beings here give the confession to God. But it's also things below the earth. Things below the earth. So if it's things below as well, then we know this is referring to hell. Because why? Remember, lost people have to confess it to the Lord. If the lost people confess to the Lord, where do they come from? They come from below. Hell. So look, keep reading Revelation 20. These dead, these lost people get judged. But look at verse 13. It's below, things below. And the thing, uh, and the sea, excuse me, the sea gave up the dead which were in it. See, that's below. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. So, we see here that this is undoubtedly the things below. But, here's something that's uh, really bugging me. Revelation 5. Revelation 5. Because when the Bible says things above, things on earth, and things below... The problem here is that it doesn't show that wording for the great white throne judgment. It doesn't show that wording for the judgment seat of Christ, for things above, things on earth, things below. Judgment seat of Christ is plain. Tongue confessed to God and every knee shall bow. That's pretty plain, judgment seat of Christ, All right, that wording. But about things above, things on earth, things below, that wording's not found with the great white throne judgment. That wording is not found uh, with the judgment seat of Christ. It's found before the tribulation starts after Christians receive their pre-tribulation rapture. So this is even before, look at the wording here. This is before the Antichrist gets unleashed. So things below are already confessing. Things below are already confessing before the tribulation starts. That's strange. Look at... Revelation 5, do they confess it? Do they praise Jesus as Lord? Yeah, because look who comes up. It's Jesus. Verse 6, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as it had been slain. It's Jesus. But look at verse 8, And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb. See that? They're bowing the knee before Jesus. So that matches with Philippians 2. They're confessing him as Lord. Notice at verse... Let's see here. 9. Notice what they say to Jesus. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book. They're singing, Worthy is the Lamb. Verse 12. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. So that matches a lot where we can see it fit with Philippians 2 where they're confessing Jesus Christ as Lord. But it becomes definitely plain. <coughs> Excuse me. It becomes definitely plain when you read the next part at verse 13. Look at the wording here. And every creature which is in where? Heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying blessing and honor and glory and power unto him that sit upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Wow, so then this happens at a time period that is after the pre-tribulation rapture and that is right before the tribulation. Okay, why do I say before the tribulation? Because Revelation 6, he unleashes the first seal of the tribulation. You see that Revelation 6, 1. Why do I say after the pre-tribulation rapture? Because you look at verse uh, 9, all of the Christians are up in heaven. These are Christians all around the world, say believers. If you look at chapter 4 and verse 1, 2, and 3, the Apostle John experiences a pre-tribulation rapture that the Christians experience. He gets rapture out of heaven and suddenly on the earth. He experiences that vision, that same plane that the Christians go through. So that's why I say after the pre-tribulation rapture and before the tribulation. Okay, then what is this things below the earth then? 
That's the question. What's this things below the earth? Well, possibility one, it could be that the people who are already damned, because it says things below the earth, right? So these people are already damned and lost, so they should already know who's the right God then. So perhaps these people are the ones confessing Jesus Christ is Lord. But then the problem is you can't just say things above, things below, and things what? On the earth, because uh, this is the Antichrist timeline. So they don't confess Jesus Christ is Lord yet. So then, if you recall my previous teaching on Revelation chapter 5, I've given you something that's very interesting here. The wording is every creature. You notice that? It says creature. So then, as if we compare that with Genesis 1 about creatures, God created the creatures that are in the sea below, that fly on the earth and crawl. So then it's referring to all of nature itself then, including the animals. So then I told you before at Revelation 5, this might possibly show that all of nature, as soon as we get a pre-tribulation rapture, something big happens. Why? Because when we have a pre-tribulation rapture, that's already a big universal shaking. So why won't it naturally follow when there's a universal shaking after the pre-tribulation rapture? All the universe continues to shake and then gives glory to God. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. So then we could have all of the creatures on the earth that could suddenly just say that out of nowhere. Creatures that are under the earth, creatures that are on the earth, and then creatures that are flying above. And that could be a huge testimony for the lost unbeliever, not just to believe that there is a God when you get raptured? I mean, that should be enough. But they explain it away with aliens, right? But then all of a sudden, the creatures in the universe, they all say, worthy is the lamb that was slain. Imagine, like I told you before, that stupid liberal professor at Berkeley, you know, he has his dog and all the pets and animals that he saved with, you know, live green and the green deal. And then he, gave, he just gave away all of his money just for that one, all for stupid stuff like that. He's taking care of his pets and his dogs and cats. And he said, yeah, those Christians, they're something else, man. I don't, I'm not going to worship Jesus. And then their dog says... But I worship Jesus. Jesus Christ is Lord. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Right in front of their lap. And then that liberal professor goes, Oh! And then he tosses that dog. <laughs> How about that? Man, that would be quite a day, man. I would love for that day to happen. So that's, so that's possibly, again, possibly the case that could happen. But that would be quite a flying testimony. And guess what? The lost world... They can explain away, if they can explain away your rapture with aliens, they'll explain that with aliens. Amen. They'll do that. Everything you can blame on the aliens. It's all the aliens' fault, you know. All right, let's go back to Philippians chapter 2 again. Philippians chapter 2. So then I see several cases here then of when this can happen then. So then let's total it out. One is the judgment seat of Christ. We see that. Judgment seat of Christ for saved believers. Second time we see this is at... Let's see. Let me write this all out here. Okay. Did it get all that wording? All right. Second thing is it's going to be at... Oh, what should we call this event? The event where the lamb is slain and worthy is the lamb. The loosing of the seals. That's the thing. And Christ loose the seals. All right. And then the third time is obviously the great white throne judgment. All of the lost people. So these two are definite. These two are definitely happening. The second one is a possibility concerning about all of nature itself. But I do know this, they have to say that when Jesus loose the seals. You might say, why? Because Revelation 5 says so. Things above, under the earth, and uh, under the earth and on the earth, they're already doing that. But I just don't know who fits that bill about below, on the earth, and above. The only explanation that I can find would be all of creation itself. Alright, now let's then this means this. Let me just total it out. You, then you know what this means? God really means it that, uh, and it's like so literal that it's figurative. 
So not obviously literal that every tongue, but literal as, as the sense that every living entity out there, every living entity that lives, breathes, and moves, and even creation itself have to say Jesus Christ is Lord. That's something else, right? That's quite a confession to me. That's quite an exaltation that Jesus Christ received. All right, let's go to Philippians 2. Verse 12. All right, let's doubt your salvation now. Verse 12. <laughs> Wherefore, so Paul says, that's why. Okay, now remember, you've got to pay attention to words. Christians don't pay attention to words. Wherefore, also the small little words. You're all looking for the deep stuff, like antichrist. You're all looking for that word, like, um, you know, 666. You're all looking for a word like something that can connect the dots or a number right there. But it's so simple conjunctions that you realize, conjunctions, prepositions, those words, that shows you a full context here. We did that with God also hath excited. Uh, God also hath exalted. Uh, I'm, I'm definitely asleep. God also hath highly exalted him, right? At verse 9. I've explained that one about also. Now I'm talking about verse 12. Wherefore, so that's why, what does Paul want you to do? So because then following this reason, right? Everyone confesses Jesus Christ as Lord. Why? Because Romans 14, we have to confess and give an account to God. So there's going to be an element of fear then. That follows logically the next part of verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, see us saved Christians. We're the beloved. As ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. So in other words, these Philippians, they've always obeyed the word of God. They followed Paul's instructions, not just when he is present, but even when, uh, when Paul was absent. They did it even more, which is amazing. Why? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. The salvation they received from God, they took their Christian salvation so seriously that when they were working it out for Him, they did it with fear and trembling. They were afraid. They trembled. Why? Because of verse 12, wherefore. That's why you have to fear and live your salvation seriously. Why? Because of wherefore, that's why, uh, verse 10, 11, and 9. See? You confess Jesus Christ as Lord. Well then, remember, what does that mean when you confess Jesus as Lord? See this right here? Secrets? You have to give an account to God. That's why you have to be serious. That's why you have to do it with fear and trembling. Alright, now uh, let me explain this before some people start to question. They go, wait a minute, wait a minute. Did I lose my salvation just now? No. Uh, notice the text here that it says work out. Is that what it said? Work out? Okay, it says, work out your salvation. Okay, so it says to work out your salvation. Notice it did not say work for. Did you notice that? It says to work it out, not for your salvation. Now, see, some people, they don't realize that. See, people think from verse 12, they're working for their own salvation. No, you're working out your salvation. Why? Because you already, it's not that you're working to get your salvation. It's because you already have salvation in you here. So because you're already saved, not that you're getting it, you're already saved. So because you're already saved, God wants you to work it out. That's the, that's the idea right there. So, then, in other words, how can you... Here's the idea. How can you follow verse 12? How can you work out something when it's not in you to begin with? See, if it's not in you to begin with, you can't work it out. In other words, until you get salvation... See, until you have it in you... See, until you have salvation in you, now you can work it out. Amen, See, that doesn't show you're trying to get salvation. See, it doesn't show that you're trying to get salvation in you. No, you're already saved. That's what it means. 
It means you're already saved, you already have it in you, but what are you doing about it? As a saved Christian, what are you doing with your salvation? I mean, Jesus Christ bled and died for you to give you this salvation, and you refuse to say, Lord, I sure appreciate what you did for me on the cross. You saved my soul from hell, so I want to serve you. Amen. I want to do something about what you've given to me. Amen. Isn't that simple? I mean, look at verse 13. It already explained it. For it is God which worketh in you. See that? So, the verse says you can work out. Why? For, see people don't pay attention to prepositions, conjunctions. It explains the whole context. The reason why you can work it out is because, see, for it is God which worketh in you. Because God already puts it in you. He's working in you. That's the idea. That's why you can work it out. Amen. Now, uh, let's look at Ephesians 2. Alright, we looked at this verse before, didn't we? Ephesians 2. And now I want you to go to Proverbs 9. Proverbs 9. We're going to look at Proverbs 9. And then we'll look at Ephesians 2. We're going to look at Proverbs 9. And we're going to look at Ephesians 2. Now notice that Ephesians 2 shows. Now this is powerful. That explains Philippians 2 here. When it talks about this working out salvation. The explanation is going to be Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. That's the explanation. The also the explanation to this working out, which people don't pay attention to, is Philippians chapter 2 and uh, verse, was it 11? What did I have said? Let me look it back there. Philippians 2, 13. 13. So it's going to be 13. So these are the two verses that you want to use to explain what this means, okay? If you understand these two verses, then you'll understand what it means. We're going to look at Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. What does it say? Not, not of works, works, lest any man should boast. So see, God's not saying you should work so that you can get saved. No, you can't do that. You receive it as a gift, and it goes in you, and when you have salvation in you, look at verse 10. For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus. See, in Christ Jesus. You notice that? Because first, you get created in Christ Jesus. See, you, get, you become a new creature in Christ. You get salvation first. Yeah. So because of created in Christ Jesus, because of salvation, you can do good works. On two good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. See, so notice that you become His workmanship. That's the working out here. You become unto good works. Why? Because you got created in. You became a new creature first Amen. when you got saved. So when you got created in Christ Jesus, that's why you were able to work out, you were able to do His work workmanship. Amen. Okay, so understanding uh, these pointers here, we're going to go to Proverbs 9. Proverbs 9. Proverbs 9. Now remember, if you're doing all this, then there's an element, obviously, of fear. So we have to fear God. We have to live in fear. We're going to look at Proverbs chapter 9. You might say, well, that's not healthy to be afraid and to be paranoid. Well, uh, we're not telling you to live paranoid, but the idea is this, is that if there's a warning sign that says, do not touch, you will be electrocuted, shouldn't you have fear? I'll tell you what, if you don't have fear, and you're like some of these stupid people who do these crazy stunts, because they have zero fear that they're willing to do crazy stunts where they injure themselves or kill themselves, you know what prevents you from killing yourself and prevents yourself from doing dumb stunts like that? It's fear. So see, we're not talking about a paranoid fear. We're talking about a healthy fear that prevents you from getting into trouble. That helps you do what's right. Amen. Make rightful decisions. Proverbs chapter 9. Look at verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the what? Beginning of wisdom. Beginning of wisdom. So... If you want to be smart, notice that the first step... I don't know if you saw that. You want to be smart? The first step to be smart is to fear God. That's the problem with people. 
You know why a lot of these educated professors aren't that smart? Even though they claim to be smart, they don't have fear of the Lord. That's why they're dumb. They're dumber than a bag of rocks. Nothing's more stupid than a professor who can solve all the physics and all the calculations and waste so many years yakking his mouth on that and be wrong about everything at the end. And he burns in hell forever. Isn't that the most stupid thing ever? That is. That's the most stupid thing you can ever do. That's why in order to start being smart, you've got to fear the Lord. Now, if you want to grow in knowledge of the Scriptures, and that's, this is a rebuke to some Bible believers who have too much knowledge, and unfortunately, some onliners who have this issue, when you grow so much in so much, so much uh, knowledge, 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 and then you become, you think that you're smart, and then you can correct anybody that, you, that, that is around you, including the Bible-believing pastor that the Lord has given to you, so that you can submit under, follow his leadership, and be fed and be guided by. And then when you have this uh, attitude, then you know, what you know what your problem is? You don't fear God. Amen. That's your problem. You don't fear the Lord. A lot of these idiots who go rogue, and they've been trained. I kid you not, they've been trained by Bible-believing institutes. But then they go rogue. You know why? They lack fear. They lack fear. If you have healthy fear, then it'll prevent you from getting into trouble. They don't have fear. They're like, oh, I can be independent. I, I mean, you can't tell me what to do. That's like a Catholic church. That's like a pope. No, okay, we're not like the Catholic church and the pope. We believe that the scriptures is a final authority. But that doesn't mean final authority with the scriptures and no leadership. Amen. No people to submit under. Well, on the world, what are you talking about? You have to have both. You have to have both. So what's a smart move? If you want to make a smart move, you know, these people think they're so smart. They're smarter than the past, smarter than every Bible believer. And then they say, oh, I'm so smart. And they can do, because I debate well. I corrected the pastors well. They're too afraid to confront me, and et cetera, et cetera. You know, you know what? That's an attitude. No fear. Yeah. I hope I got some people under conviction by that. Yeah. So before you go all prideful, you better, you, you better watch that attitude of yours. That means you lack fear. All right, is that a good lesson for y'all? All right. Now watch yourself next time before you open your big fat mouth. All right, some of these people think that they're so smart they can promote a new doctrine and stuff like that. Listen, I put crazy stuff online, okay? But I always put a disclaimer. Possibility, my opinion, my theory. All right, I know better, okay? And I even say I could be wrong. All right, let's go back. Philippians 2. Philippians 2. Now, we understand that this is the idea that we're supposed to do, but the fear should be raised. This is a good passage at verse 12, where the Bible says, when they obeyed, it says always obeyed, right at verse 12? So they, fought, they worked it out. They've always obeyed. But it's not just, uh, not as in my presence only. See that? They didn't just do it when Paul's present. Look at the wording here. Oh, those sing single words make a huge difference. But now much, what? More. They did it way more. What? In my absence. Did you see that? People don't pay attention to those words. Look at that there. So notice that they served God more during absence than the presence. Okay, you know what? That's a good sermon to preach. You know what the sermon is? The sermon is, uh, I, I don't understand. Why would you serve the Lord? Why would you fear God more when you have brothers and sisters in Christ next to you when pastor has to pre preach like an A-plus sermon to you and you can't do it when it's absent? Wow. wow. That'll preach. <laughs> you, have to have, uh, you have to have your husband to keep you right with God? You have to have your wife to keep you right with God. So you have to have your pastor to, uh, around you to motivate you to get right with God. You have to have your children serving the Lord to finally get you to come to church. Parents. So uh, until you have a bunch of brothers preaching on the street, then you feel like you can preach, right? Amen. And then some of the people, they feel like I can do soul winning when I'm doing it with my brothers and sisters, but you can't do it by yourself. How about that? You, you're going by the flesh. You're going by the flesh. You should have been there when I was just one man. 
Let's see how long you last in church. That's good. Some of the people know what I'm talking about. They've seen those moments when I was just uh, one person in the church or two. They know what that's like. It's not easy. You tried doing that by yourself, street preaching. I had to do that. Didn't you know that? Because people didn't come to uh, visitation, street preaching. I had to do it myself. College campus, I had to do it myself. I did. Why more, though? And this is something that the Church of Philippi had that you don't have. Why is it they are able to do it more during absence than when people are present? Simple. Because relying on people who, when they're present shows it's more of a fleshly thing, not a spiritual thing. You need, to, you need to serve the Lord. You need to get excited. You need to bless His holy name when there are people around you. huh? You need a revival meeting to do that. You need a summer camp to do that. You need a blowout to do that. What's the matter with you? What's, a, what's, what's your problem? huh? When you're going through a suffering and a trial and, you, and you're all by yourself in the house, you can't do that for the Lord? You need to wait for summer camp to come and then you can get excited for the Lord. What's your problem? That's good. See, that, that's all flesh. See, you're dependent on uh, people present. That's fleshly. What's spiritual is when it's absent, that's why it becomes more. You know why it becomes more? Because it becomes less when it's here. Why? You're relying on someone. You're relying on an atmosphere. You're relying on a Dr. Peacock sermon. Yeah! And then you finally just get on the altar. You know what your problem is? You about time get right with God when it comes to an A-plus sermon message. You can't do that by yourself in your room. You know how many times I had to do that? You think I get the opportunity and privilege of an A-plus sermon all the time? No, I have to preach it myself. I have to have the Lord deal with me in the privacy of my life. All right, we need, we need, we need to, uh, what a way to kill a summer camp. All right, I'm going to preach that one during summer camp. I'm going to preach that at summer camp. Just kill the whole spirit, you know, after that, you know. No one's going to be shouting after that, you know. All right, now, now the thing is, or they might shout even more. I don't know what might happen after that. All right, but the point is, is that, see, it, you can see why it's less, and this is more. See, so why? Because they've learned to fear Good. They've learned about this. This is the judgment that I have to face. How about you? What a, uh, I might as well, good time to end it, right? Whoa. You're saved. You're lucky, man. I just had to end it right here because time's up. All right. All the calls open. Let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I uh, thank you so much for your word that can always uh, help us and teach us to grow, help us to always pay attention and to always live the way that you want us to live. Following the example of Jesus. That's the thing. Following the example of Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.